opiates. Okay. Now, one of the first things that we'll do, uh, just address some terminology. Uh, you have drugs that are opiates, and you have those that are opioids. Okay. Um, so the opiates, these are the substances that are of natural origin, or they're naturally occurring. Okay. And the main source of these is the poppy plant. Okay. And so your poppy plant. Uh, from that, um, you know, scrapings from the sap, you get opium, okay? And so the examples of our opiates or our naturally occurring substances, um, the examples here, of course, opium from which we get morphine and also codeine and you also can get small amounts of uh, thebane from... Uh, the opium as well. So opium and then its major components again are morphine, codeine, and then there are uh, small amounts of thebine in that as well. Okay. Uh, opioids, these are semi-synthetic or completely synthetic uh, drugs. Okay. Uh, a lot of these drugs have morphine in them and then they have other substances that are added to them which is why they're called semi synthetics uh, or those that don't have morphine but have morphine like uh, compounds uh, would be completely uh, synthetic so again our opiates are naturally occurring our opioids are those that are semi synthetic or completely synthetic and so some of our examples for our uh, opioids um, are going to be, uh, of course, heroin, uh, a lot of the uh, new drugs that you have, uh, not new drugs, I'm sorry, but a lot of the other painkillers that you hear about, Percocet, Fentanyl, uh, Lortab, Nortab, uh, those types of things are our uh, semi-synthetic or completely synthetic okay so once again our opiates those are naturally occurring derived from the poppy plant so you got opium and then opium's main components are morph morphine and codeine and then you've got sabine okay opioids are semi-synthetic or completely synthetic examples are heroin and I did not mention before heroin is the morphine molecule with the acetyl groups added to it um, and then I think I mentioned before things like Percocet, uh, Fentanyl, Lortab, Nortab, uh, things like that. Um, and uh, so some of those drugs, Percocet, etc., uh, will have Sabine uh, in them uh, with things that are that are uh, added to them. Okay, but I'm not going to ask you about those different types of drugs. I just want you to know, well, opiates. Okay, but I'm not going to ask you to distinguish between a lot of the uh, semi-synthetic or synthetic ones. Okay, now here I've done something a little bit different than our other lectures. I've kind of put everything into a table in terms of administration, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion uh, for these drugs. Okay. Uh, morphine is a weak base, has a pKa of about 8, which means that it will be easily ionized. Um, uh, generally, it's taken orally, okay, um, but morphine can also be delivered IV if you've ever known anyone who's had uh, surgery, medical procedures, you know, you have morphine drips, but in some settings, you also have morphine lollipops, uh, things like that. Okay, uh, heroin, okay, remember on the previous uh, slide I said that this is morphine with acetyl groups that are added to it, okay. The addition of those acetyl groups to morphine makes heroin uh, much more lipid sol soluble, excuse me, than morphine by itself. But here's the important thing to understand here is that heroin, okay, in its chemical composition, is a substance that is extremely lipid 
soluble. Okay, that means that it gets in the bloodstream quickly. Okay, it's absorbed very quickly, gets to the brain very quickly. Okay, but here's the thing that a lot of people do not realize: the heroin molecule is inactive. Okay, at the opiate receptor sites in the brain. Okay, uh, you'll see it. We'll see it later on. Um, uh, on this slide, but what happens is, is that you've got this really lipid soluble substance that gets delivered to the brain, but then it's immediately converted into morphine. But because it's so lipid soluble, all of that got to the brain. Okay, and so it's much, you know, it's much more powerful than than someone who is just consuming morphine by itself because you're delivering more morphine to the brain in this really lipid soluble package so it's packing a punch but uh, heroin the heroin molecule itself is inactive at the receptor sites in the brain it's the morphine molecule that's been delivered or all these morphine molecules that's been delivered in this lipid soluble package okay it's like on a fast track to the brain that are responsible uh, for producing effects okay so heroin can be taken intranasally, okay, uh, injected IV or inhaled, where the you know where heroin would be smoked uh, and the vapors, etc., would be would be inhaled. Excuse me. Um, so in terms of absorption and distribution, morphine molecule has slow absorption. After it's absorbed, it becomes concentrated in tissues and bound to the brain. Okay, remember it's generally taken orally. Um, okay. Uh, heroin, on the other hand, remember we said this is a very lipid-soluble delivery package, essentially. So it gets to the brain very quickly. Okay, uh, because morphine is taken orally, it's subjected to significant first-pass metabolism by the liver. Okay, heroin remembers intranasal IV or inhalation. So this this gets to the brain very quickly, but once it gets to the brain, it's rapidly converted to morphine. Those acetyl groups come off of it, so you've got monoacetylmorphine in the brain, and then you've got uh, you know another additional acetyl group that gets uh, gets knocked off of it. So it's the morphine molecule again that acts at the receptor sites. Okay. Uh, in terms of excretion, uh, with morphine, 10% gets excreted in the urine unchanged. The remainder gets broken down into metabolites, which get excreted in the urine and the feces. So the half-life is about an hour, half hour, excuse me, half hour. Uh, excuse me, the half-life is about two hours. <laughs> I keep saying this backwards. Excuse me, it's about two hours. And nearly all of what the individual takes is going to be eliminated within 24 hours. Okay, so you're going to have a similar scenario for the excretion because once the heroin gets converted to morphine, then the excretion is going to mirror what would happen if the individual just took morphine. Okay, so again, morphine primarily um, taken orally or it's given IV in hospital settings. Its absorption is slow, but after it's absorbed, it's concentrated in tissues and bound to protein. Heroin, remember, is a much more lipid-soluble compound, but it is in and of itself an inactive molecule, does not act at the receptor sites in the brain. Heroin is generally taken intranasally. IV is what we hear about most often. That's the most, probably IV and inhalation, the most common uh, routes of administration for heroin, okay, because it's so lipid soluble, gets to the brain very quickly. Once it reaches the brain, it's rapidly converted to morphine, but you've delivered much more, okay, in this lipid soluble package to the brain, okay, and it's the morphine that produces the effects at receptor sites in the brain, okay, and then its excretion. Um, is going to be similar to just morphine. 10% excreted, uh, unchanged in the urine, remainder broken down into metabolites, with a half life, two hours. Okay, I got that out. <laughs> um, okay, this time. And then uh, most of it, 90% or more, is eliminated within 24 hours of the administration. Okay. Uh, these are some examples of, uh, these are actually opioids, 
Uh, but one of the things that you'll notice in your textbook um, is that we make these distinctions between the naturally occurring opiates and the semi-synthetic or synthetic opioids. But just for ease of discussion, you'll notice that your textbook uh, most times is just going to say opiates or opioids. The, the, the terms are used interchangeably. Um, but you know, but it is important that you realize that that there is a difference uh, between the two. So these are um, some examples here. You have uh, mepiridine. Um, so you may have heard of Demerol. This is what Demerol is. This is metabolized in the liver. Metabolites are eliminated by the kidney. The half life um, is about three and a half hours. Okay. Then you've got methadone. Methadone, um, we're going to talk about again later in the chapter. Uh, methadone is what's primarily used uh, for uh, uh, individuals that are uh, recovering from uh, morphine, heroin addiction. Okay, so methadone is not completely metabolized, 10% excreted, unchanged in the urine. It has a half life of 10 to 25 hours. So in individuals who are recovering from morphine, heroin, um, or heroin addiction, you have methadone clinics. And so you've got a half-life of 10 to 25 hours. So individuals generally have to show up once a day to get their um, methadone. Okay, Methadone is bound to protein. Um, uh, and then low doses. Uh, You've got uh, excretion uh, happening in the feces, high doses. You tend to see more uh, appearing in the urine, more excreted in the urine. Okay. Then we've got naloxone. Um, this is an antagonist of morphine. Uh, you'll hear quite a bit about naloxone, and you're probably hearing a lot about it in the news right now. Naloxone is uh, used primarily to treat overdose of uh, morphine or heroin, okay? Uh, and it's also used in research. But, you know, what you're hearing about now in the news is, is you know, individuals lobbying to make this more readily available to prevent these overdoses, okay? Uh, and it's effective... Um, uh, as a treatment for overdose because it is an antagonist of morphine. It's a complete antagonist of morphine, meaning that it will displace any other opiate or opioid from the, bind the receptor binding site, okay? But it has no effect of its own, okay? So uh, the, the danger uh, or the risk here is that the half-life is about an hour and a half. And uh, so you have the possibility of, uh, you know, some of those overdose effects uh, still being able to happen depending on how much of the drug an individual is taking if the effects of the naloxone have uh, worn off, okay? Now, one of the things that I neglected to mention when I talked about uh, methadone uh, you know, remember I said that this is primary, primarily used in the treatment of uh, morphine, heroin um, addiction, okay? One of the issues with methadone is that it has uh, a weak effect of its own, okay? And so some individuals who are on methadone become addicted to the methadone itself, so it's not without its problems, okay? Um, so that's uh, important to understand as well. And then you have LAAM, which is levo alpha acetyl methadol. Okay. Um, this has a half life of more than 25 hours. This is, uh, you know, would be useful in uh, also treating um, heroin or, or morphine addiction. But um, because of uh, dangerous side effects, uh, this is really not used uh, nowadays, um, causes uh, serious heart arrhythmias. So although it has a, a pretty long half-life, it's something that can pose some pretty significant problems in terms of uh, the heart. 
Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about the neurophysiology of opiates. Okay. So, uh, whether or not you know it, you've got opiate receptors in your brain. Okay. Why are they there? They're there because our bodies have naturally occurring substances that use those receptors. Okay. And those substances are called endorphins and enkephalins. Maybe you've heard the phrase sometimes, get the endorphins uh, flowing. Okay. Um, these are the, the substances. These are our polypeptides generally. But these are the substances that people, uh, even if they don't know what the names are, but these are the substances that people are talking about um, when they're talking about the runner's high, when you push past that point of, of pain. And so these are our body's naturally occurring uh, pain relieving substances. Okay? So again, you've got opiate receptors uh, in the brain, okay, because we've got substances called endorphins and enkephalins that use those receptors. And in terms of what those substances do, those are the body's naturally occurring. Uh, pain relievers. And so, of course, you know, um, the pain relieving abilities of these substances will vary from individual to individual and, uh, you know, also according to, to what the pain is. And so if there's very, very serious injury, uh, you know, there are sometimes when, uh, you know, an individual has sustained a serious injury, you get the release of these substances, which may delay uh, the, the, the sensation of pain and those types of things, okay? But we've got those receptors because our bodies have substances that use those, okay? So there's three major uh, opiate receptor subtypes uh, in the brain. You've got the mu, delta, and the kappa opiate receptors, okay? Uh, so you'll read in your textbook that these three receptor subtypes, subtypes have distinct distributions in the brain. Okay, so what does that mean to say that they have distinct distributions in the brain? That means that these three types of receptors are found in the same brain regions, but within those brain regions, their distribution is not overlapping, okay? So even though they're found in the same brain regions, their distribution within those regions are, excuse me, is distinct, okay? So I explain it like this. So say if you were in my face-to-face -face course, we would all be, you know, I would have students, different students, who are all in the same classroom. So if the students each represent a receptor subtype, okay, uh, and I've got all these receptor subtypes that are in the classroom, your distribution is distinct because there's only one student in any one location in that classroom in terms of a seat. Students are not overlapping. You're not sitting in the same seat. So these receptors, these mu, delta, kappa, opiate receptors are found in some of the same brain regions, but within those brain regions, their distribution is distinct. Their distribution doesn't overlap. You don't have mu receptors sitting on top of or, you know, sitting on top of, of kappa or sitting on top of delta, etc. They've got distinct locations within the brain regions in which they're found. Okay? Alrighty. Uh, this slide will take a little bit of discussion, so why don't we take a break here and I will resume uh, with our discussion of the mu opiate receptor and why it's important.